Uh, this morning we have a very interesting subject that not only goes back to the old philosophies, but also comes down to modern times. And that is this problem that we have of time itself. The past, the present, and the future. There is an old saying in the philosophies that the past is dead. The future is unborn. Only the now is actually available to us. Uh, there is much more to it than that, but uh, I'd like to point out that for most purposes, our present humanity functions on these three levels. And the ones who live in the past and the ones who live in the future, so to say, are the ones that have become of interest to psychiatrists and psychologists because they are the ones that accumulate a variety of peculiarities. <laughs> the uh, problem of living in the past is a distinct failure. Every, most everyone we know somewhere is tied to memories. Memories of childhoods, memories of broken homes, memories of delinquent children, all kinds of memories. Many of these memories are more or less negative, and many of the people who have them are more negative. And the result is, there comes a long cycle of self-pity, a great many problems in which the individual feels that he has been unjustly treated, and also gradually comes to live in his own misfortunes. Many of these people go off by themselves and live as hermits or separate from their families and relatives and live in a retirement home. Many of them are more or less unhappy about society. They feel that they have been shortchanged. They believe that in one way or another they have been mistreated by those around them and those near to them. So that this phase of life presents us with the glory of the past the past of wars, the past of crime, the past of wealth and poverty, the past of sickness and death. There is a long story behind this past. This thing that is gone and dead, actually, is a very much alive in the subconscious and subjective of human beings. And in school, of course, we are reminded of this very strongly. Not only are we told about the miseries of the past, but in the past also, many of the wonderful things we have done, like inventing gunpowder and things like that. <laughs> we also find, then going back, that our families and our communities and our countries have been unfairly treated. We have been enslaved by some powerful despot, and generations have gone into difficulties. We therefore have a certain pity for persons like ourselves and a strong resistance against the persons who have done the things that we seem to remember or well, not kindly. So in the past there is a great big puddle of trouble and many people today live in it. And when we read the newspapers in the morning there's a good reason to remember it because a large part of news journalism is based upon the past. It is based upon things that happen which are now revenge. It is, they are based on all kinds of mistakes that were made, of all kinds of infamies that were committed, and uh, the modern individual sits down and begins to realize that these past things are largely responsible for his present troubles. So he gets a very negative attitude toward the past. The past to him is a symbol of failure, a symbol of uh, contact with things that were unfair and unreasonable. Of course, there were exceptions to these things. In our old New England, why we used to have old families, they were very proud of the fact that they never had a new thought in five generations. <laughs> This was a symbol of loyalty. It was also something that helped them to keep up the good old golden days and ways. They were the ones who established rules 
that today nobody could keep. But to these people, these rules were elegance. They were the sign of refinement. They were the signals of people who really amounted to something. So that lots of families have elders who were important. Then there were also families that had elders that were significant as citizens. There were some who were great in business, some who were great in religion or philosophy. They were educators. And in every family or two, there were one or two people who did something that was interesting, unusual, perhaps meritorious, and perhaps not. But anyway, they did something. And they become the family heroes. And on a larger scale, the national heroes. The world heroes. And we remember in the past, we remember not only Pythagoras and Plato, but Napoleon and Genghis Khan. And we begin to recognize that we inherit from the past memories that are important and memories that are very bad. That brings us to another condition. Why not recognize that this past is a sort of textbook? And if we read it correctly, we will find why it died. Why the past isn't with us anymore, factually. And this on largely in the loyalties of the living to the beliefs and spirits of the dead. So we go on with this type of thing and try to find out just exactly how much we are indebted to the past for what we are. So first thing the average person can do is sit down and take a piece of paper and a pencil and sit down and try to figure out the things in his own past that have affected him. What kind of parents did he have? Now, the, fact the parents are all gone probably by now. But they still live in him. And if he feels that they were unfair, this unfairness may still be influencing him. This unfairness made him run away from home and marry when he really didn't want to. He start a family when he was not mentally, emotionally stable enough to do so. Thus the past got him into trouble. And the conditions of the past have overshadowed his life all the way into whatever condition he is or perhaps beyond to the grave. So we have to think of the past rather carefully. But I also have to realize with a psychiatrist that these negative thoughts are a form of sickness. The individual who can estimate his own failings in terms of what other people did to him is already sick in another way. If we try to find out that the reason we've been unhappy is because we were born into the wrong family, this is not factually sound. It is excusable. It has been generally accepted. But actually, each person, if he uses the resources given to him by nature, has a personality of his own and can decide how he intends to live. If he has no intention of trying to find out how to live, then he becomes a victim of pressures from the outside and then soon he becomes a psychiatric patient. So we have to realize that a lot of mental illness is affecting people who are unable to escape from their own past. And this condition goes all the way. Now, in our generation, the, fact that the past may not be very far away. There are broken homes that have been broken in the last six months. Six months ago was in the past, but very shallow. It was so near that it re represents almost a, a part of our daily living. But actually, the moment an individual finds out to his own content and assurance that he is living in the past, that he is remembering old grudges, that he is remembering that he wasn't the favored child, but he remembers that the family broke up and he was sent off to school or to relatives he never knew. All these different negative things, uh, that he had to go into the army and that ruined his life, that he made a bad marriage and that ruined his life. And on that basis of thinking, it's not difficult to be ruined eight or ten times during the course of an embodiment. <laughs> Everything that once starts to go bad or starts to go negative has a tendency to deepen in that direction. So we have to look at people today and see if we can find ways to get them out of the doldrums 
that come from memories. And memories can be very tricky things. They can be very beautiful things. But the perverse memories can be a very sad and disheartening aspect of our compound constitution. So we have to try to figure out what to do with these people. One thing is to try to move this individual from the past into the present, into the now. Actually, the now is the only reality that we have. The reality of now is that at this moment I can make a decision. I can make it of my own accord. I can make as I feel is best. A minute after I've made it, it becomes part of the future or becomes part of our own past. But there is a moment when now permits us to change. That now permits us to do something differently. That enables us to break this pattern. After we have put in this new pattern, it may become a tyrant in time also. But for a moment it may release us from a misery that has carried us all through the years of life. So we do try to remember that no matter what has happened to us that is unfavorable, there is now a moment of understanding, a moment of realization, a moment of ex acceptance, and also a, mo a moment of realization that the longer we nurse the trouble, the sicker we'll get. So where pressures get very heavy, where sorrows get very heavy, some turn to alcohol, some turn to narcotics, some commit suicide, and if you start to think, and in starting to think, a new pattern comes in. A pattern that we know that for one moment we are master of our destinies. Once we have proclaimed our mastership and have decided our destinies, it had better be something more important than we've had before or we'll be right back where we were. But it is quite possible for the end of the individual to make a new start any moment of his life. He can have a start at 3.04 and he can have another start at 3.05. And that time, 3.04 is part of history. There is a moment of decision every moment of our lives. And it is the decision of that moment that is the basis of growth. The basis of the individual asserting himself over the providence which he finds objectionable. Now, if he makes another bad decision, he is in more trouble. But he still has made it. And perhaps out of a new decision comes a new realization of values in the future. So there's no doubt in the world that we are dealing with a lot of submerged sorrows that have come out as a result of remembering the past. I know one lady came to me for discussion. She was a younger daughter and the family would not allow her to marry until the older daughter was married. And what happened? The older daughter married the man the younger daughter wanted. <laughs> now that was a catastrophe. But it was one of those things that happened. Now that could ruin a life. But then on the other hand, it didn't have to. It could be recognized as one of the circumstances of existence. It could be it recognized as an opportunity to grow, to deepen, to understand, to rise above a disappointment. It perhaps to build a new value in life, simply upon a value that had not proven itself to be permanent. So every time we come upon a challenge out of the past, we either perpetuate the past or break it up or cause something to come along that takes the edge off of it as a force to hurt us or, in, or endanger our survival. Therefore, the past is a sense, a kind of judge and jury. If you make the same decision that you got you in trouble in the first place, you will be in trouble again. If you do not find some answer that is more reasonable, even then the old answers will hold and your life will be burdened thereby. There are all kinds of things that can happen that when we take hold of the past, the individual who hasn't spoken to a relative for 15 years can suddenly gather up the courage to send them a Christmas card. 
and perhaps end the feud. That God went in a moment of now. Something that we forbidden to do because we can do what we will until we have done something else that blocks it. So this ended a feud and the people older but wiser mended a situation that had disturbed the family for years. Another individual had a very bad marriage. In this very bad marriage with a divorce, two small children were involved. The uh, mother, the children, felt that this situation was not her fault, that things had happened that should never have happened, and that somebody else was to blame. So these are the things that could be taken into the idea of dead yesterdays. But then now comes the problem of what to do to make it a dynamic living tomorrow. So when the time came to take care of the problem, the individual had to determine whether he would keep the uh, feud going, whether he would continue to be injured, to continue to be subjected to tyranny, or whether they would, he would grow up out of it and think of something better. Also, we find things of this kind come up in business. An individual has a job that is not very pleasant. He isn't enjoying it greatly. And in the job he's in, he makes a series of unfortunate mistakes. These are blamed on someone else, never on the person. But this costs them the job. So now we have another individual with a task which is now to their mind filled with unfairness. There's something that they have been injured that they did not deserve. In the past, their minds did not permit them to recognize the fact that they did deserve this. But if they've grown up a little into that moment which is now, they could see from the viewpoint of now why, we were, why they were wrong then. And in this moment, relieve themselves of a very heavy burden of memories. In fact, every time we look back into a family situation or a world situation, and find it intimidating or depressing or dangerous, we have to realize that it is part of this tendency that we all have to perpetuate the sorrows that have come to us. Now we have nations today. Nations are having a very unsavory time at the moment. They're getting into all kinds of patterns that are objectionable. And most of these patterns tie back to a feud of some kind. And this feud ties back in turn to some ancient grudge that has been carefully perpetuated. Now, the grudge may have been so far back and so insignificant in itself that it was generally forgotten. The average member of the community did not even remember it or hear it, even never have heard of it. But when the time comes to create agitation or attempt a revolution, somebody digs out the old unfairness dramatizes it and everybody goes to work on it. And this is the same type of thing in world affairs. Nations that have carried feuds for 500 or 1,000 years break through them. A nation that has been tied down to a certain religion or a certain philosophy finally rebels against it. And after going through a certain period of purification rises above it. Now, in nations and in various community projects, the uh, idea of the past, the idea of the uh, negative uh, survival of mistakes just by memory alone has now become quite important. We are beginning all over the world to analyze some of these mistakes and realize that they were most of them unimportant, but were dramatized and magnified by years of meditation the individual had a bad marriage, had been living that down through years of meditation also. And very often, the individual who got into a trouble or a nation that got into a difficulty repeated did the same thing again and had again another example of this mistake. If, um, if you do it once, any, it could be anybody's fault, they say, but if you do it twice, it's yours. And this is what happens. These people have perpetuated a feud. Now, we read the newspapers and you will find out how this acts. You will find out that the minister of something or other dug up a record that his great-grandfather or something or other uh, was mistreated. 
and it was a terrible thing. And therefore, the clan, the family, and the country are now all by, by back of a the writing of a wrong. Everyone involved in the wrong is dead, but the grudge goes on, and it has to be cleared up. So, in the problem of clearing up the judge, the uh, the uh, grudge that we had, we may have a war or an outbreak, thousands of people killed, homes destroyed, all about something that's been gone over hundreds of years ago. It's the same way in our modern life, in our home. We had nursing grudges only for a year or two maybe, but by the course of that year we have broken a home and maybe broken the lives of children. So everywhere you go back to the negative, that is the dead past. We are reminded that it is the, the better part of philosophy that the dead past should bury its dead. Everything in us that carries back should be a constructive memory. Now, if we can't say that the incident itself is particularly pleasant, that can be true. But that it is unpleasant, but it led to something. If it helped us to cure something in ourselves, it was well worth it. Therefore, if there's a grudge anywhere in our own natures, which we feel have been, we have been slighted or wronged, our first real problem is to examine the details. Maybe again over a long time in life. To find what we should have learned instead of constantly looking for an opportunity for vengeance. To revenge an evil of the past is a very common thing today, politically, socially, religiously, economically. We are constantly resentful of anything that we consider to be unfair. But the only type of unfairness that we do not resent is our own. We expect that to be given every possible consideration. Now, on the other end of the stick in which we are concerned, we have tomorrow, the unborn future. Now, all things that exist in the moment of now will probably have some kind of survival in the future. In other words, lots of people are building futures. A lot of people are trying to create a future that will be of service to them. But supposing a person who is trying to create a better future happens to think of some of the unfair suffering he has gone through. The result is probably going to block uh, the improvement that he hopes to gain. If the future is merely an avengement of the past, if the future is, the, is only a time in which what we hoped for or wanted, regardless of whether we deserved it or not, is going to happen, then we are again in trouble. The future... It should not be considered merely a period of the fulfillment of our desires. The future should be the fulfillment of that which is necessary. Because if it's to fulfill your desire that you make a pause, then you will be in the same place as the ones who are suffering from the past. If you, the past may be a case in which a personal injustice was committed. If we do not correct it, then the future has no uh, bearing for us. So two sisters have lived in the same community for many years, but haven't spoken for a long time. But these now, in the future, may speak to each other. If they can now speak to each other, then the future has become significant. If they continue not to speak to each other, and start talking to about the brotherhood of man and so forth, but do nothing themselves, then the future is simply the past projected into time to come. Now, most people in their right minds do not want the future now to be merely a projection of the present. We know that the things that we have been doing and are now the past, the immediate past, is a black mark against the future. That in the times to come, if we continue as we are now, we will corrupt the future completely. We will do all the things that we shouldn't do. And we have considered the future only as a period of the fulfillment of desires. The individual has been poor all his life. He hopes that before he dies, he finally will make his pile of money somehow. And they all, all those who have not succeeded may die with success on their minds. But in every instance, 
the future is regarded as a period of reward. The individual, something wonderful is going to happen. And that makes the future interesting, makes it enjoyable, makes it something we all like to work with and hope for. But in so doing, if we ask the question, what have we that we deserve that is going to make a happy future? Are we earning into the future a better destiny than we have had before? If we are simply seeking to get rid of the problems, but to continue to nurse the grievances, we are just exactly where we were. There is no way in which these things can be solved simply by shifting them into the future. The future has to have a remedial factor. It has to be something better than we have had before. Therefore, the future must be based upon the past as wrong and then present a problem of now. And when you get through realizing that we were wrong in the first place, that the problem is that we brought forward into the present and now think to take it into the future, unsolved political problems, unsolved family problems, unsolved world economic issues, then we cannot expect anything very fortunate. We have to recognize the importance of the future correcting mistakes. Now, I've been watching the newspaper as it comes out now. Uh, Someone's notes were in trouble for oil. We just had another tanker go up and a great loss of oil. And, uh, the, but somebody in their mind thinks, well, probably by the need time we need it, we'll discover another place where there's plenty of oil. We will have another one. Or if we do not have another one, we will use something else instead of oil. We will find a way out of this difficulty without changing ourselves. Without changing our own desire to do exactly as we please. We want certain things, but we will not suffer for them. They must be made pleasant and happy. Now, if in the karmic laws that were recognized in the Orient actually hold good, but nearly every problem we have today is ancient business. We are now in the midst of problems that should have been solved five or ten thousand years ago. But because they were not solved then, they were carried on to a thousand years from now, and we had another chance at them and muffed it again. Now it's only a year or two to pick up the same problem. We've been, it's always done the same thing to us. We know definitely inside ourselves that we cannot win against facts. But we'll keep going on believing that they'll find another source of oil somewhere under Greenland or something of that nature. That we will not have to cut down, that we will not have to re- regiment our facts and, and problems, that we will not be required to give up any luxury that we want. The, there will always be a solution. Well, this is the point that we can't depend on any longer. We are beginning to realize that the possibility of maintaining the future as a kind of Eden in which we will all come finally to the promised land is optimistic. The, we cannot do things that are not doable in nature. And we cannot definitely do things that we don't deserve to do. We cannot have a joy that we have never earned. We can never have a security we have never earned. We, have, we are here in this world to learn something. If we don't learn it, that constitutes failure. And failure means come back and try again. So all the way along the future now, we think of the golden age to come. We think we're going to solve all of the problems we have. We could, but we cannot unless people themselves get on this thing we call now, the, the moment, and in the moment make decisions that change the course of the future. If we expect the future to change its own courses to please us, or take it for granted that if we amble along full of mistakes, we will get through somehow. These things are going to defeat the problem of progress. So we have to settle down and begin to think a little bit about it. Thinking about conserving, because that is the way 
to survive under the present system. And yet everywhere we look, we find that people are not mature enough to look forward with hope and joy to hard work. We do not want to work. We want to recreate. But only God knows what, how we expect to recreate. Most of the recreations we have now are not only stupid, but vicious. If we want to try to be happy in the world as it is, we have a very big job and we can never win it. Because there's nothing really basically here to make us happy. We have to earn happiness so we don't have it. That was one of the secrets of the Arabian Nights. Entertainment, those famous old stories. Happiness must be earned. We are not earning happiness in television, motion picture, literature, music, art. None of these things is being used to earn merit. So there being no merit, there will be no result of merit. Now merit is a term used in Eastern philosophy very generously. It means actually something that is deserved. It means that if we have a certain merit, then we will have a condition appropriate to that arise in our society. No merit, no progress. No merit, no peace. We must do the things that cause the thing we want. So we have in front of us another now, we have the future. The future which is all kinds of things. The future which is hope. And uh, maybe it will come true, but hope doesn't happen to much if it isn't earned and deserved. So we have all kinds of possibilities of making this a better world. But we cannot do it simply by hoping. Nor can we do it on the grounds that the present policies will do it. We are already in the presence of policies we know won't do anything. Or if they do do anything, it will be make, to make problems worse. There will be no way of getting the future we want simply by sitting back dreaming about it, holding the thought, and hope we can find a candidate to elect who will do it. It can't be done this way. We want, we want to take the old and reform it. We want to build it into the new and make a better world for all of us. And this is a job. This is something that cannot be done by prayer alone. Or, if we want to say it, the most profitable prayer that will do the job is work. If we earn it, we can have it. But we are not earning it. You pick up the paper today, a terrible earthquake. Wars, seditions, anarchy. All these things in the world by people who want peace, want happiness, want security. Every one of these people would like to have a safe life. But they say, go out and vote for danger and get it and begin to destroy themselves. So here is a future that could be filled with possibilities but is likely to become part of a past that went sour. So we have to get to down to the facts of the matter and say the past is dead, the future is still unborn. No matter if the future starts today or a hundred years from now, every moment is a future. But any moment from now is a future according to what we do with it. And whatever we do with it, it becomes part of the great pattern of the world in which we live. Now then, we know several things that need work. We know the problem of the fuel, we know the problem of food, and air pollution, all these things. We know the danger of narcotics. All these things are here. Now how do we solve them? If we go back to the past which we can still remember or some of we will find that the past had exactly this same problem the past had the plagues the past had all the difficulties war various dangers hazards earthquakes all these things troubled the past and the past didn't solve them it has given us a, a new kind of cotton machine has given us telephone, television, but it has never made the world safe to live in. It has never helped the individual to unfold the resources within himself. 
It, all that we get is a kind of panacea, which panacea has nothing, on the grounds that if we follow the rules, we will be able to survive. But we are following rules now, but we are not surviving. We are knowing beyond all doubt that we are using man-made rules to run a divinely made universe. We are here to use our own yes and no's and have our own senates and congresses to pass judgment on situations and conditions which we do not understand and never will. We do not recognize the fact that beyond all these other things is common sense. And common sense is something we can't get along without. And this common sense has to come in. And it's summed up in the Bible very simply. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. We, as simple as all that, we've got to cause these securities or we cannot have them. So in the past, we have insecurity. In the future, we have a potential area for the correction of insecurity. But if things drift, it will be just as insecure as all the rest. And between these two, we have a moment of decision. We have the individual who has the right to say yes or no. The individual who has the right to stay with what he believes at this moment. And most of all, to depend very heavily upon common sense. Now, for the now man, what are the basis of the rules that he has to work by? If he lives to take what he is now, and the world as it is now and make it better where is he going to get the rules well I think Ben Franklin summed them up pretty well and so did Bacon he's going to get the rules by the realization that if the thing works it's the rules if it doesn't work it isn't the rules if he puts in a whole group of new rules and two years later there's another war the rules weren't the answer the rules are not shadows written out in something or hung on a wall. Rules are working instruments that accomplish the necessary. If they do not accomplish the necessary, they are not the rules. So we try to find out what the rules are. And by probably Ben Franklin is one of the ones who gave us some of these rules. His very simple answer was that the real rule is common sense. Now, common sense is something that everyone is born with to some degree, but it is usually smothered out in the cradle. It also, if there's any of it survives, it is killed off in the public school system. The common sense is the one thing nobody wants because they realize that if they have common sense, they're going to have to live better. And this is a very serious obstacle. The individual does not want to live better. He just wants to get, a, get even or get away with the things that help him to keep what he's got or get more. So that, there is no probabilities here. But Ben Franklin told the thing very definitely. The answer is common sense. Common sense is the most uncommon of all the sensory perceptions. <laughs> it is based upon the simple fact that a, an average 12-year-old child if asked a question within its comprehension and uh, it can express itself, it will probably give you the correct common sense answer to a common sense problem. It will tell us definitely the experience of all time on working with the matters that we have to face. Ben Franklin said, waste not and want not. Well, that's pretty good common sense. This is an age of wastrels. We waste just about everything. We base, waste three quarters of the world wealth on munition and armament alone. We, wish, we waste our natural resources. We waste uh, gasoline. We waste everything you can think of. Simply because waste means a little added luxury. And because of a little ad added luxury... We're going to wake up someday without the necessities of life. So Ben Franklin summed it up very well. Want not, and you waste not. And if you want too much, you will waste. And here is the great age of waste. 
I think every one of us realizes that every time we go to the mailbox in the morning. We find it stuffed with literature that we didn't order, don't want, and will promptly throw out. But it is using a valuable pulp, it is using up time, using up everything you can think of. Wasting simply in the hope of one thing alone, and that's profit. And sometimes it undoubtedly makes profit. But it's a very expensive way to waste our natural resources. Because it means that one of these days, maybe 10, 20 years from now, we won't have enough of that resource to send a, a, a single circular to a prospective customer. We need to understand these things. We need to get down to the simple facts of life. So from the past and its mistakes to the future which could make the mistakes, again, we have to pass through the now. We have to pass through the moment of consciousness. There is a consciousness in each one of us. We have within ourselves the most priceless integrity that can possibly be imagined. In every time a major issue comes out, we will feel an impulse of that integrity. Even if we go out and vote for war, there was a moment when we knew we shouldn't. If we also want unreasonable profits, there is something in us that will kind of give us a little conscience twang. But we cast that aside quickly and go on and take the profit. And in a short time, we're unemployed. A study of the facts of life is far more important than any of the elaborate findings that go out of commissions and people of this nature. They are out trying to fit all these things together under the problem of how to cure a situation without changing it, basically. We want to know how to be rich and to be richer and to abolish poverty uh, without anybody paying anything. Uh, it's not very likely to do it. We know now that everywhere along the line it is breaking down. We find, for instance, that it's now costing $80,000 to put a young person through a modern u university of first, first class. This is a complete waste. There is no reason in the world why every person in the world has to be a millionaire. And yet now very little less is considered even possible. And we buy all things and pay for all things on this basis. Where is the common sense? If the thing that we buy at an exorbitant price is an absolute necessity, we may have to struggle with it a little bit. But if it is a sordid luxury that makes no difference one way or the other as to the final working out of things, then we should simply cut off the extravagance. There is no need to be extravagant when there's nothing we can take with us to the graveyard except our shroud. We have never been able yet to resist the temptation of temptation. We have never been able to stand strong for principle if it meant that we had to save or be careful or we had to be thoughtful or generous. These things have got to come in change and they've got to come pretty soon. So we have now the three moments of time, the past, the present, and the future. The past we messed up pretty badly. The future we could mess up if we get around to it the wrong way. And in the middle is now. And now is the human mind. It is the mind as an instrument of knowledge. A mind capable of common sense. A mind that is not trained into ineptitude by false educational standards. A mind that thinks. And thinks simply. And thinks in a common fact way. And recognizes the fact that if we expect to survive, we must stand firmly for the processes and changes that assure survival. Otherwise, we, even if we come by, we are going to gradually be a race of malnutritioned people. We are going to have nothing to eat that's worth anything. We are going to have no, none of the ideas and concepts that are important to us. And in this now mind, we also have something to think about. 
if we have enough bad generations, the now mind is damaged. And when the time comes to make a decision, the now the no mind is not going to be able to see as clearly as it should. All kinds of propaganda disable the thinking of the human being. And this propaganda is necessary to permit us to keep on making the mistakes that are profitable to somebody, whether they are profitable to us or not. So now we have come to the really another the thing. We are going to get to go on repeating every day in the paper the new problems that arise. We understand little by little the difficulties that we all face, but we also might begin to think a little bit about this developing discrimination and integrity for ourselves. We do not need to fall for every temptation that comes along. We do not need to hunt for bargains forever in a world where we won't find any. We can't, don't have to buy the things we don't need simply because a neighbor has one. We don't need to pay fabulous salaries to people for work that is very mediocre. Little by little, by censorship of our own conduct, we can gradually reduce waste. And if we get rid of waste, even though it doesn't cut down the whole pattern, if we get through with waste, we will add maybe a hundred years to our problems of survival. We've got to do something to change the pattern. We have gradually wasted away the planet on which we live. We have allowed it to be exploited. We have transformed a beautiful world into a terrible graveyard of wars. We have also changed the ambitions of the individual. Instead of seeking to be good and happy and have ideals and a family life and a good job, we want nothing less than opulence. We want also the privilege of having lung cancer if we want it. No one should make a law that we shouldn't have it. If we want to carry guns and shoot each other, that's a privilege. We should never be interfered with. And if anyone says to us that we shouldn't do any of these things, there's no cry go up. The answer is not to raise situations which are going to have cries like this. If the individual who is thoughtful simply doesn't do the things which he knows are not right, little by little, his influence will increase. There is a marked rising now of efforts to meet some of these challenges, to do better than we have done. If so, we can move from dead yesterday to brave, to brave tomorrow. We can go across from the, by crossing the bridge of integrity. If we go across of our own free will and joy in the future, we can achieve many of these things. But if we stand on the near side, on the side of memory, and say it's all terrible, and prove it by 50,000 quotations, we'll still be the same. And we can watch our legislators, we can watch everyone involved in these matters, to see if we can find the ones who are able to take the problem and face it in the terms of nature. Every problem we have is part of natural law. Every problem that we have is faced by nature on all kinds of sides, in every direction. And a wonderful, natural, intuitive wisdom guides the decisions. Man is capable of this intuitive wisdom much more even than the animal. There are things that animals won't do that human beings do every day. They do not recognize the values of the faculties with which they have been endowed. So we know that uh, one of the things that we can do, in the past we can organize the memories so they will teach us something. In the future we can organize our hopes so that they can accomplish something. And in between, in the now, in this moment, we can organize our recognition of values until we begin to do things first that deserve first action. We, the decision to do it right is ours. And it is based on perhaps the sorrows of having done it wrong too long. But if the time comes, we have to make these changes. Now if we make them by revolution, we have thousands of dead. We have horrors of 
beyond working of people who would rather die than straighten out their lives because they do not realize that their lives are in their own hands and always have been. But if we can get things started, something will happen. And it'll, something that will happen that's very valuable. Now in between yesterday and tomorrow, there is this I. There is this self. There is something that is in a mysterious way free from all these attachments. It is in us, but we have to use it. It has to be called upon to express itself. We have to make a rule about it. In the Orient, we have laws and we have systems of philosophy that help to develop and strengthen the discriminations that we need. But over in the West here, we're supposed to be graduates from those kind of rules. We're supposed to do right because it's right, not because we have to be taught to, to do it to please the gods. We have to do it to please ourselves that we have to be right. But if we are right and can get to that kind of thinking, then we will realize there's no need for revolutions. There's no need for tearing down the statutes. Little by little, step by step, we will correct the mistakes. And in so doing, we will discover that it is this correction of mistakes that is the reason we are here. We are here faced by decision. We are faced here by a problem that always presents two appearances. This is for one purpose primarily. It is to help us to grow. Instead of having a teacher tell us these things, it has circumstances reveal these things to us in no uncertain terms. We have to know by experience. And the experience that will help us is that of just, just uh, judgment and the integrities of philosophy. So if we use the simple rules of common sense, we don't have to worry about all these great big things that are such problems for us. We come along all right. And we come out without any major upheaval. The world isn't going to get very unhappy over the fact that some of us are a little happier. Then it's not going to wreck everything if we are not corrupted. If we want to buy where the product is reasonable, this is not a sin. If we don't think by things we don't need, this is not a crime. It is an economic mistake. But the economic system should have been changed long ago so that it wouldn't have been a mistake. A system of economics that has to survive on extravagance is no good. A system of government that has to depend upon policing peoples is not right. But each individual has to be given a caretaker, has to be given a nurse or an orderly or someone to take care of him until he can take care of himself. So at the present time we have nations with billion dollar, multi-billion dollar annual budgets to help people to take care of themselves. And that little question is sometimes, who is being taken care of? But we'll pass over that likely. The fact remains that we, uh, we can, with a little bit of thoughtfulness, recognize what to do and how to do it. We can recognize that in ourselves, in our heart of hearts, in our soul, in our spirit, is a divine power forever resident. The spirit in, with us is good. The soul is its agent. The soul is a wonderful, beautiful necessity. It is something that guides us in ways of righteousness. If we listen to these things in ourselves, we will not be deceived by shops, shoppers on the outside. We will not buy things we do not want simply because of advertising. We will think quietly, work things through, and will gradually develop a sense of merit. Now this will be very useful not only in the near future. We may pass out of this life before the world is on a merit system. It is quite possible. And it's possible that our children's children will pass out before it is a merit system. But if we start now, it will be more meritorious than it will be if we don't do anything about it. A 50% improvement would be so remarkable that we wouldn't recognize the planet anymore. But we had to start 
with ourselves and within each of us is the power of redemption we can redeem convert redeem and save our own resources we can think through our own values we can be worshipful of our own good we can see the God in our own souls and recognize and serve that God in the souls of others around us we can move from the materialistic foundation of spend and spend to a more idealistic foundation of use and use correctly if we will do these things we will find a more or less painless revolution and certainly it will be a little inconvenient we will have a little worry over the idea that some prize fighter is making ten times as much money as we are making but if that gets all very serious in your mind remember what the prize fighter does with the money gets nothing it's gone in a few days or some luxury or at most he has to go to the grave taking nothing with him but what he brought so that all this great fall around about fame and fortune is part of a viewpoint that has no foundation in integrity and integrity says we're here to do interesting things if we didn't have to worry about money we could be artists musicians we could do all kinds of philosophy we could serve each other we could develop new ideas that would add thousands of years to the life expectancy of living things we could have the investigation of values and we could gradually develop within ourselves knowledge that we could take with it beyond the, with us beyond the grave the only wealth that we can take beyond the grave is our own soul and the more we develop that soul the more we work with it the more we turn it to unselfishness the more we use it for the development of securities for the needy and idealism for the ones who are ready for it we can help to have a better generation of children we can get over a great many problems without ever for one minute making anybody really unhappy because the people who don't believe in it don't care anyway and those who don't care anyway will have to wake up a few more times before they know what it's all about but they'll be along anyway you don't need to worry about them too much we see in the last month year or two a marked there it's change in the attitudes of many governments and many people individuals and races and communities a realization of the importance and the need for the ensoulment of the skills of life we need to know that we are here to learn and that the things we are supposed to learn have to do with universal good not simply the problem of making a few dollars while we're here so if we remember the sorrows of our past and remember that humanity is passing through those same pains that hurt us so desperately and that we can also remember the things we have done in the future will do in the future and have done in our futures from day to day where we have done things that were good things that were wrong where we have abused the privileges of life but we have also found out some new things some new beauties in the human soul we suddenly become more aware that we are not evil creatures we are simply children growing up growing up searching to understand searching to searching for growth and someday we'll be victorious this now these kind of thinkings i think we will find that uh, we can live on our, our neighbors right now a little easier we will when the moment we realize beyond question that all antagonism all that type of conflict all jealousies all conflicts of competition are unworthy of the human being when we realize this i think we'll come along and have a much better life and a much better hope for the future thank you